Hello and welcome to the first edition of IMTV, that's the International Marxist Television Channel, brought to you by Socialist Appeal, the British section of the International Marxist Tendency. Uh, we're going to be bringing you regular news and analysis on current events, revolutionary ideas, and today we're going to be having a bit of a birthday celebration. It's the 200th birthday this weekend, on the 5th of May, of the main man himself, Karl Marx. And uh, he was born in 1818, on the 5th of May, in Trier, in Germany. But he died uh, not so far from here, where we are today, in London. So as I said, this weekend is Marx's birthday, on the 5th of May. And to celebrate, we're going to be hosting a special event, Marx in a Day, hashtag Marx200, uh, in the very building where we are actually filming right now, in University College London, uh, where we're going to be discussing Marx's ideas, their relevance to today, his economic ideas, philosophy, historical materialism. And to explore these ideas more, to explore about how Marxism is so relevant today in the 21st century, uh, I'm joined by uh, two guests. We've got Josh Holroyd from Socialist Appeal, uh, a regular writer and on the editorial board, and Fiona Lally, a student activist and president of the SOAS Marx Society and recognisable to many as the face of communism in the uh, Murdoch press recently. And, uh, and this word, this idea of communism, it uh, is, as Marx said himself in the Communist Manifesto, it's a spectre that's haunting Europe. And, uh, and you see that, actually, I think, in the... Um, in the, in the mainstream press. Uh, just the other day, Mark Carney, the, uh, the, the head of the Bank of England actually, um, said that, that communism was going to be on the rise because of the, the mass unemployment, the wage stagnation due to automation. Uh, he said we could see communism within a generation um, and said that Marx and Engels uh, may again become relevant. Um, we see this all the time, obviously, in the, in the bourgeois press, the, the idea that Marx was right, I think was a headline in uh, Time magazine, in uh, Rolling Stone. Uh, I think even the Pope was accused of being a Marxist <laughs> recently. Um, and I've also been told uh, that, Josh, you're the owner of a, a manga version of Das Kapital. Yeah. So, um, I can't read a word of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's pictures. A picture says a thousand words. Um, but, Josh, why do you think it is that um, we're getting all these headlines uh, and, and all these statements from people like Mark Carney? Why is it that, um, that Marx is back in the press? What, what is it that he's right about? Hmm. Well, I don't know where to begin with that, really. But um, I think a big part of the recent headlines and editorials talking about how Marx was right can be found in the preceding period, that over the last 20 to 30 years, the opposite message was the one that we read in the media all the time, that actually after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that was categorical proof that Marxism was either always wrong, or it perhaps had been right in certain aspects, perhaps about Victorian production, and now it's completely out of date. And it's really, really startling, amazing really, to look at the kind of statements which were coming out of the leaders of the capitalist world and the intelligentsia of the capitalist world about things like the end of history. People will probably be familiar with that from Frank Francis Fukuyama already, talking about how basically capitalism and liberal capitalist democracy was the end state of, of the development of history. And now once we've reached that state, all we've got to do is export it by mass bombings, of course, but once we've exported it across the world, then we will leave, live in perfect peace and harmony. The, uh, Gordon Brown famously said that they'd done away with boom and bust. This was the kind of, I mean, hubris, with retrospect. Will he was 50%, right? They got, <laughs> they, they, they got rid of all the boom. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and now, I think that there is, there is actually a genuine shock. I think part of these um, headlines and editorials, it's not simply like a cynical thing. I think that the crisis in 2008 and the ensuing, you know, the Great Recession and the ensuing, I mean, depression really that we've entered into and the, the political and social crisis which has come off the back of that has got many um, figures in the capitalist world and, you know, intellectuals, journalists genuinely thinking what on earth is going on and stri uh, reaching out for ideas and finding none. It's very interesting that, I mean, I think it was Paul Krugman Mm. Who, who was a Nobel, Peace, no, Nobel Prize winning economist, economist yeah. said that the last 30 years of macroeconomic theory have at best been useless and at worst positively harmful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not a very good record. And so people, I think, are seeing crisis, looking for some kind of explanation, not finding any from, I suppose, what you call the bourgeois establishment. Mm. And so instead of pointing to Marx, usually with certain caveats that we can talk about, but I mean the fact that Rolling Stone magazine 
decides, I mean, I'm not that familiar with the production of Rolly Stone, but I thought that was a music magazine, has decided mm. to write a list of things that Marx got right, mm. all of which he did get absolutely right, really tells us something about the deep, not just economic, but social and intellectual crisis that society finds itself in. I think that the 2007-2008 well, crash is probably the most graphic example of the, import, the mm. central role of the banks to the global economy mm. in, in history, as far as I'm aware. We had a situation where bankers, um, were, they were called bankers, stock market traders and so on, they were called the masters of the universe. That mm. was the title that not only they gave themselves, but they were given by the media. Because in a sense, in a, I suppose in a sense they were, in terms of the central role that they played in the economy. Banks were too big to fail. And then they did fail. And the result was, first of all, chaos. But then the states that have been preaching non-interference in the economy, the primacy of the market, the perfection of the market, had to step in and spend billions and billions of dollars or pounds or whatever mm. to bail those self-saying banks out. And if I think that that has, maybe it's taken time to seep in, but I think that's had very, very dramatic, I would even say revolutionary repercussions on the consciousness of ordinary people, perhaps also, you know, editors of newspapers, which is for me. Yeah, and on mass kind of consciousness as well. And particularly, I was going to ask you about this, Fiona, about with the young, you know, the younger generation. Um, you know, amongst young people, students, there's, there's clearly a, a ferment kind of going on, big mass movements. Um, you were, uh, as I say, in the Times um, commenting on uh, the kind of rising popularity of Marxism and socialist ideas, revolutionary ideas amongst young people, amongst students. Why do you think it is that, that revolutionary ideas, that Marxist ideas are gaining popularity um, amongst, uh, can we say our generation? You're a bit younger than me, but uh, uh, amongst younger people, amongst students. Yeah, no, well, I think with my example anyway, I mean, I was 11 when the financial crash happened in 2008. Um, so my entire adult life, my entire political life, um, I've only seen decline and I've only seen uh, chaos in the market, in the economy. So I've kind of, I've grown up in a system that is clearly not working and those are the headlines that I'm receiving and that's what I see in the in the stock markets, on the news all the time. And I think also uh, what's happening in the world at the moment isn't just an economic crisis that young people can see, but also politically. Mm. Um, so many countries are in turmoil um, with the election of Trump um, and with the Brexit result in the UK that no one saw coming. There were no political commentators or editors that thought that was going to be the result that we could see. Um, and so I think people can see crisis on every single level um, of society. And on top of that, um, I just want to comment on um, the idea that Marx is fashionable or um, interesting as an alternative, which is something that's often put towards young people. There's this idea that we don't understand the world, we've not been, we're not old enough to understand, or the idea that you know once I become older and I've worked for a bit, then I won't want to give up my money, or all this kind of stuff. Um, which I think is, community. yeah, yeah, <laughs> which I just think is wrong. I think young people are questioning this economic system because they see it can't work. Um, and they're looking to the ideas of Marx and it's starting to make sense. Yeah, so Fiona, one of the things that you were talking about when, um, when you first got your press attention, it was on, uh, as a result of an interview you did for BBC's Radio 4 Today programme with John Humphreys. And from what I remember, they brought you on because of a survey that had been done showing that young people were more concerned uh, or felt more threatened, if you like, by big business than by communism. And there's been other kind of similar polls showing, you know, uh, the kind of radical mood that's there. Uh, we had one in the, um, in the revolution uh, paper that the that, that Marxist Student Federation produces, um, which talked about kind of the, the mood amongst young people for a rebellion or an, or an insurrectionary overthrow of the government. And uh, I think Wales was up there along with Greece and uh, Italy and Spain as being where young people were, you know, willing to, to kind of overthrow uh, governments. Um, what do you think these, these kind of polls say? Like, where do, where do these figures come from? Well, I think, you know, for a young person today, if I take myself, for example, I'm going to graduate university with over £40,000 in debt. Um, I'm unlikely to ever... Uh, live in a secure home that I, I know I'll be in for the rest of my life. Um, the job market is uh, virtually non-existent for graduates at the moment. Um, and, you know, if young people are faced with a situation of no possible future, even in the UK, uh, recently, uh, it you know, there are certain parts of the UK that are actually declining in life expectancy. 
um, wage growth in Britain at the moment is the lowest it's been since the Napoleonic Wars. There's no real um, kind of work hard, get a good degree and you'll live a good life. Um, that idea doesn't exist for young people anymore and it's just not a reality. Um, and people can see who is causing these problems. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're touching on there really this idea of um, the establishment, the, you know, we are the 99%, the 1%, these are the kind of slogans that have kind of come back to the fore actually. Um, interestingly, in the last 10 years, obviously Occupy uh, and uh, the, the, the kind of no cuts, uh, anti-austerity movements that we see in Britain, um, you know, employing these kind of slogans again about inequality, the rich versus the poor. Um, I mean, this, this brings to mind for me the Communist Manifesto, you know, the idea that all history is the history of class struggle between the, the oppressed and the oppressors. Um, it's, it's an idea that, that you know, isn't that fashionable uh, a lot of the time in academia, particularly uh, amongst the kind of liberal media, the idea of class society is something to kind of hush hush. Um, and for that reason, you often hear this idea that Marxism is kind of outdated. Uh, you know, he's talking about a period in the 19th century um, where everyone kind of imagines workers, you know, being in the kind of the burning mills, the, the dark satanic mills and the capitalists with their kind of top hats, Mr. Moneybag type characters. Um, and I think for a lot of those reasons, um, Marxism is kind of, like I say, it's painted as being outdated, um, old fashioned, uh, because it deploys this kind of class analysis. Um, you know, calling for workers of the world to unite. Mm -hmm. um, Josh, what, what would you say on that? Would, you know, is, is, is it fair to say that, that things have changed dramatically since the 19th century? Does, do, you know, are we all middle class now? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of accusation that's thrown around uh, by the critics of Marxism. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, to give a bit more of a developed answer, I think that things have changed since Victorian times. But fundamentally, we live in exactly the same social system. Mm. It, would be, it would be, I think, bending the state too far the other way to say that nothing has changed in Britain since Victorian times. Mm -hmm. One major change in British society has been extensive deindustrialization. Mm -hmm. And coupled with this has been a, an, an extremely, I'd say, a, a very right-wing um, reactionary idea that being working class is someone who works down a mine, mm -hmm. who works in a factory, and, um, and kind of conforms to these certain, usually very reductive tropes about how a person behaves, the kind of language they use and things like that. And so if you don't conform to that, mm. if you go to work um, in, a, in a suit and tie, then how can you possibly be a worker? Mm. And that is absolutely fantastic from the point of view of the state, of the ruling class and the establishment, because it leads to, frankly, a very bitter divide within the working class. You can actually see it over the whole Brexit vote, the working class was split. And you have lots of people, especially in the liberal media, going on about all oh, these stupid backward workers in places like Sunderland mm. and, and basically dividing workers against each other when really what we need is for the working class as a whole to be uni unified precisely against mm. those layers, uh, against the establishment. What's happened uh, on a worldwide scale is actually the, the working class has never been bigger. Mm -hmm. well, I think one thing we have to remember in Britain, we shouldn't have a parochial attitude, that whilst mines and steel mills and so on have been shut down in Britain, they have been op opened elsewhere. Heavy industry still exists, it just has been shipped out because actually it was possible to exploit people on even lower wages than in Britain. That's one of the reasons why that kind of production was unaffordable. But then you've also seen the rise of like things like Amazon warehouses, which many people describe as actually kind of like Dickensian Victorian conditions, right? I mean, Absolutely. you hear these horror stories. Was it Sports Direct where um, a woman apparently had to give birth while she was on the job because she was too worried about the taking the time. Yeah, and, uh, and people having to basically like wear nappies while they're working because they literally can't afford to take the time for a toilet break. You know, it's the choice between eating and, uh, and pissing. And I, mean, I mean, that sounds to me like things haven't even changed that much in mm. some respects. But the, the thing I was going to ask Fiona it was, um, you know, you're in the, the Marxist Student Federation, you're a student activist. Um, there's been big strikes recently amongst the universities, um, presumably a, a, a layer of society that you know 30, 40 years ago would have considered itself quite privileged. I know um, you were also out on the picket lines when the junior doctor strikes were happening. Again, a very privileged layer until recently. What do you think this says about 
you know, the relevance of Marxist ideas in terms of a class analysis? Well, if anything, I think it shows that Marx's ideas have never been more relevant and it, you know, you know, shows in practice who the working class are and what Marxists mean when we talk about the working class because ultimately it's about your relationship to the means of production and so when we think of doctors uh, we think of lawyers and we think of university lecturers we think of these people as quite middle class and quite well to do um, that don't really suffer you know the harsh uh, working conditions as people in Sports Direct for example but actually in the past couple of years we've seen them all on strike um, and that's because I think we've seen the proletarianization um, of a lot of what you know would normally be considered um, relatively comfortable jobs um, and that's the result of an economic crisis that we're in at the moment um, and it demonstrates how important a uh, class analysis is um, in order to fight back against these things because you know people are realizing who the enemy is if mm. you will and who um, is causing all these problems in society and I think the recent UCU strike is a, is a great example because we saw you know the majority of students supported their lecturers mm. in that strike and all the polls the majority of students did and you know you had a lot of students out on the picket lines with them and they understood that you know this strike wasn't just about lecturers being mm. annoyed about their pensions uh, it's linked with you know the wider marketization of education mm. and on top of that it's linked with the wider crisis of capitalism in society that's also hurting the NHS mm. um, it's also hurting lawyers it's also hurting you know it's hurting everyone on all layers of society no matter what their job is apart from the very Apart from the, the yeah, CEOs of course. And the bankers. Apart from the bourgeoisie, um, and so you know, it's a, it's a brilliant demonstration of the, how correct Marx is, mm. um, and I think you know, students being able to see their lecturers out on the picket lines and seeing them fighting um, for you know better working conditions, fighting you know for what they deserve, will also have an effect on them because you know they realise that that could be them, you mm. know, in 20, 30, 40 years, and you know they recognise the importance of solidarity. I think mm. in that moment. The UCU strike has been a brilliant example of solidarity between workers and students who, you know, students typically are a certain section of society that isn't always associated with the labour movement because, you know, they're not technically workers. But, you know, in the UCU strike, I think we saw the importance of students and the role that students can play in the labour movement as a whole. So, guys, I think we need to address the elephant in the room, which is obviously communism, <laughs> Stalinism, uh, because this is really, if you like, the stick that's always going to be used above all to, to beat our movement with. Um, you know, all these, these articles about Marx was right, they always say, you know, they always start by saying, well, Marx's analysis of capitalism was, was spot on, you know, he predicted the crisis, he predicted the revolution and so forth. But, and there's always a but, there's always a caveat, and they said, well, look at the Soviet Union, look at Mao's China, you know, this is where it, where it gets you if you follow Marxism to its logical conclusion. Um, you know, Fiona, this was what was thrown at you, obviously, when you tried to defend socialist ideas and Marxist ideas on uh, Radio 4. I think you were called like an apologist for mm -hmm. Stalinism or something like that by Orlando Figes, Figes, Figs, we're never quite mm -hmm. sure how to pronounce his name. If, you, if you're watching, uh, <laughs> let us know, R type it in uh, phonetically, please. Um, but yeah, you, you defended communism and, and the gains of the Soviet Union when you were on Radio 4. Uh, and like I say, you were lambasted for this um, by the Tory press, by, by the Times, the Murdoch media, by people like uh, Figes. Um, you know, what, what would you say in terms of if someone came to you and said, you know, I, I, I agree with everything you say, but... The Soviet Union. Yeah, absolutely. No, I defended uh, the Soviet Union um, because I think there's a lot um, we can learn from it, um, particularly the gains of a planned economy, full stop. Um, and, you know, all the one thing that's often, you know, used to attack Marxists, um, or was used to attack me, is obviously the repression and the deaths that happened under Stalin. 
Um, and first of all, I would point out that Stalinism and the kind of degenerate bureaucracy um, that came about in the Soviet Union was the result of, you know, the degeneration of the Russian Revolution and not, you know, the resolution of it, not seeing it through. Mm. Um, and moreover, I think that when people talk about the deaths under the Soviet Union, this is very much selective moral outrage. Um, because I would point out that five million children starve to death every single year under capitalism. Mm. Um, and also the transition into capitalism that we had, how many people died mm. under the British Empire, how many people died under colonialism, how many people died um, under slavery. Mm. Um, these are all great deaths. How many people are dying every single day um, under capitalism? Um, and academics like Orlando Figes or whatever his name is um, have made great careers out of slandering the Russian Revolution. Fantastic careers. He's written a lot of books about this. Um, yet doesn't have a word to say about the, you know, the atrocities that happen under capitalism. Um, so I just think that point is really important mm. to make um, when we start comparing deaths or numbers, um, which is obviously a bit grotesque. Um, but yeah, I think you know, even despite all of the problems with the Soviet Union, of which there were many, you know, if you compare the Soviet Union to what it was um, at the start of the Russian Revolution to what it became, you know, 50, 60, 70 years later, its industry developed enormously. Um, it became the second largest economy in the world, essentially. And that was thanks to a planned economy. And I, and I don't think it's wrong of us to point that out. And it's important for us to point out what a planned economy can do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And also the impact of when it collapsed, right? Yeah. I think, uh, wasn't it someone, I've, I've heard statistics saying it was the biggest, when, when you had the collapse of the Soviet Union, which you talked about earlier, Josh, it was the biggest collapse of an economy outside of wartime uh, and, and life expectancy dropped by several years um, and, and poverty figures went up. And obviously what you've got in Russia today is hardly a paragon of, uh, of democracy and uh, kind of liberalism now under Putin. Um, but you know, rewinding from that, we talk about 1917 as being the greatest event in human history with the Bolshevik Revolution, the, the, the Russian Revolution led by Lenin and, and Trotsky and the Bolsheviks. Um, where did it go wrong, Josh? Like, where, you know, where, if, if, if that was the greatest event in human history, and, and Fiona's described the kind of, of the end point of, of after this degeneration, you know, where, where did that come from? Is, is, is the degeneration itself proof that Marx was wrong, uh, in fact? Hmm. Well, starting with the, the first question of where, where did things go wrong? I think it's important to explain why we say it's the greatest event in human history. We don't say it because we think that thereafter everything was just an, en an endless string of, of joys and, and everything was hunky-dory. We say it because it was, with the exception of the sad, tragically brief episode of the Paris Commune in 1871, where the workers took power in Paris and then were brutally massacred, it was the first time that the, the workers and the oppressed of society didn't just rebel, but actually managed to physically really take power into their hands and try to forge a new society, something that gave immense inspiration to oppressed peoples, not just workers, but all oppressed peoples, mm -hmm. all over the planet. That is an enormously progressive event. Arguably one of the most, if not the most progressive events in all of human history. That does not mean, therefore, that anything that happens afterwards has to be a success. That's, that's something that kind of the Stalinist um, well, frauds, really, who uh, turned Marxism into a, a dead caricature, they tried to use the heritage, the progressive legacy of the 1917 revolution to justify all kinds of crimes, not only against the people and workers of the Soviet Union, but also against Marxism itself as a theory. Mm. They said things like they were building socialism in one country. Mm. I defy anyone to go through the collective works of Marx, Engels, Lenin or Trotsky and find a defense of this idea. It was something that was effectively made up on the spot to justify a false policy of a bureaucracy. And that's the key point. Uh, obviously, we probably don't have time now to go into detail about the degeneration of the Soviet Union. It's, it's worth the discussion in and of itself. But it's always important to remember where the revolution took place, where and when the revolution took, took place. It took place already, economically speaking, in one of the most backward countries in Europe. Mm. It's called you know, known as the, the sick man of Europe, the, the regime, the absolutist Tsarist regime, was l viewed all over Europe and the world as, of, as a bastion of reaction. Mm. 
uh, of, uh, of fascist-like reaction. Mm. You have a revolution against that, which topples the absolutist monarchy, and a process which is clearly leading towards dictatorship, whether that be under Kerensky, the, the then leader of the, the short-lived rep bourgeois republic, of Kornilov, an extremely vicious right-wing general in the well, former Tsar's army, or the restoration of Tsars himself. The Bolsheviks and the workers, clearly the most progressive layer in society, takes power, but that doesn't mean that they're, you know, they, they somehow are transported to another planet or to a different state of affairs. They had to try and build, not even socialism, they didn't see themselves as building socialism. Marx wouldn't have seen it that way either. They were build, laying the foundations for socialism and to act as the spark to set off a world revolution. Mm. Marx was always very clear, yes, the work, in the Communist Manifesto he said the workers had to settle accounts, to use this expression, with the bourgeoisie in their own country. Mm. Makes sense, I mean, they are together in a country. It did not mean that they then build a socialist paradise in that country. Mm. Capitalism being a global world system, it throws us into global crises as we're living through. Mm. It also requires a global answer. Mm. It needs a worldwide revolution, something that actually began with the revolution in 1917. You had revolutions in Hungary, in Germany, revolutionary events in Italy, even sleepy old Britain. Mm. Even the Labour Party was affected with the drafting mm. of its Clause 4. All of these things are immensely progressive. The reason it declined and degenerated, which is indisputable, is precisely because of the isolation and backwardness exacerbated by the bombardment, by the invasion of foreign armies, by the blockade, the bombardment, and the constant attempts to undermine and destroy the entire enterprise. It strikes me as slightly hypocritical to say, oh, that didn't work, when you know, your class effectively, or the system you defend, has spent the last hundred years conscientiously, mm. Mm. and in some cases quite effectively, trying to strangle it at birth. Mm. It seems to me like a slightly, um, I don't know, uh, tasteless argument to make. What failed in the Soviet Union was, yes, a nationalised planned economy, which I consider to be enormous, pro enormously progressive and achieved miracles considering where it was. And sat on top of that was an enormous, monstrous, vicious bureaucracy, which not only committed crimes against its own people, but ultimately it starved the economy, led mm. to stagnation and collapse. What exists now in Russia is more or less the same bureaucracy mm. is now in charge on basically a mafia, oligarchic basis, but without any of the benefits of the planned economy. Mm. It seems to me that capitalism, this wonderful system, has managed to retain the worst aspects of Stalinism and lose anything that was progressive and worth fighting for. And so we also have to, we have to ask and answer the question of, okay, we reject Stalinism, how could that have been defeated, or how do we make sure that the revolution that we're fighting for avoids those kind of things? Mm. And internationalism is the key here. Mm. Even at the darkest periods in the history of the Soviet Union, there were glimmers of hope when you had revolutions, uh, uh, revolutionary events in places like Hungary, which of course over the other side of the, the Iron Curtain at the time, but also in France in 1968. Mm. and in Britain and in America there were plenty of opportunities for the workers to actually lead the overthrow of imperialism let's just stop and think for a moment what the effect on, in the Soviet Union on the, the oppressed workers of the Soviet Union under the, you know, the Stalinist Jack boot would have been if there had been a successful overturn in France which was very much on the cards so we talk, discussions like this should endow us with a sense of responsibility that if we want to fight for a genuinely democratic progressive socialist society we can't relieve ourselves of the responsibility by saying that an attempt a hundred years ago didn't turn out successfully. Mm. Mm -hmm. We have to set ourselves on the path to achieving that in the here and now on a worldwide scale. There are no excuses not to, in my opinion, anyway. So coming to today, um, you've talked about the, you know, the need to, to put theoretical ideas into practice, to link theory and action. Uh, Fiona, you're in the, 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 the president of the SOAS Marxist Society. Um, you know, we've all spoken at Marxist Society meetings around the country, and the thing I always get is, um, these days I find more and more, is that people will agree with everything you're saying in terms of, you know, they nod along saying, yeah, brilliant, socialism, Marxism, revolution, sign me up, you know, how? How do we do it? How do we have a revolution? You know, what's, what's the first step after we leave this room? Um, what would you say to people who you come across, uh, young people in particular, who, who have that burning desire to change the world? Yeah. Um, well, I think first I'd point out that Marxists don't start revolutions. You know, we don't spark a revolution. A revolution happens. Um, when the working class, you know, in its masses, you know, take con takes control of its own destiny, you know, moves to take control of its own future. And that happens with or without Marxists. There have been plenty of revolutions um, throughout history. 
what Marxists can do is, you know, push and give and preach the ideas in that movement, in that revolution, to make sure it's successful and to see it through. And that is uh, what people should be doing if they're serious about socialist revolution. And that's why um, we put emphasis on the role of Marxist theory and the need to study um, Marxist literature uh, in order to understand history, understand how the world works. And so I would say and encourage all students to join their local Marxist society, you know, get involved. You can see, you know, we've just seen, you know, the most militant UCU strike in history. You know, campuses are alive with energy, they're alive with um, movements and struggle and that's something that students can get involved with um, and I would just encourage all people to, to do that so that they can you know be a part of seeing through a socialist revolution in their in their lifetime. All right well I think that's a good place to end for today thank you Fiona thank you for Josh thank you to all our viewers and our listeners if you're on the podcast uh, write in if you've got any questions or suggestions for topics that you'd like to see discussed on future episodes of IMTV We'll be back in a couple of weeks with more of the latest news and analysis of current events and revolutionary ideas. In the meantime, check out www.socialist.net and www.marxist.com for all the latest news and analysis there online in terms of articles and videos. Uh, and also, as I say, uh, come along to our Marx in a Day event on the 5th of May in UCL in London. Uh, we'll see you there for a great day celebrating Marx's birthday. Thank you very much. See you next time.